In our last segment, we talked about the question of what happens when a person is living in a particular culture and he converts to the Christian faith. What happens? And we were saying that a person does not leave their culture when uh, one accepts the Christian faith. One should remain within the culture, but Christ begins to bring about a transformation within that culture. And we used the Maasai of Kenya as an example of that, um, where they were a warrior tribe. And when Christ came into that tribe, you remember that they laid aside their weapons of war, began to live in peace with the tribes surrounding them. Um, but they continued in many ways to practice their Maasai culture, as for example, their diet, their food, they liked it very much. And the way their women dressed with many beads, they continued that practice within their culture. And so we say that within the Christian movement, the gospel, Christ, brings about conversion, a change of spirit, a change of heart, uh, and also begins to bring about a change within the culture of those things which are, which are not life-giving, but that the culture as a whole is blessed by the gospel as the gospel comes into a culture. And so, if you're living in culture A, and here is culture B, and it is from, and the church is in culture B, but here you are within culture A, and you have come to believe in Christ, it does not mean that you need to change now into this new culture, into this culture that the church is present in. One can remain in one's culture uh, without moving into another culture. Let me give an example of what I mean. I think it sounds a little bit complicated. Some years ago, with, within Islam, the Quran comes to us in Arabic. It's, it's an Arabic Quran in heaven and it comes to us in Arabic. And so if someone converts to Islam, they need to learn at least to do the prayers in the Arabic language. Um, so some time ago, I was uh, in a uh, mosque in Baltimore in the United States and uh, with a group of Christians we were invited to come and we're sitting in a circle in the mosque and an old old man came in from off the street and he came wobbling up to the front tottering to the front and he said to the Imam I want to become a Muslim and the Imam that's the leader of the mosque and the whole Muslim congregation said Alhamdulillah praise be to God this man wants to become a Muslim. And so they asked him to say the confession of faith, uh, which he did. Uh, there is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is the prophet of Allah. But he said it in Arabic. La ilaha illallah, Muhammadun Rasulullah. The confession of faith in the Arabic language. So he said that confession. So they said, now you're a Muslim. And that's right. The confession of faith, given in, given in sincerity, makes a person a Muslim. But then the Imam said, remember, the prayers are in Arabic and the Quran is in Arabic. It came down to us in Arabic. So you need to learn Arabic, at least enough Arabic to say the prayers in Arabic. But don't be concerned about that. We have an Arabic school here in the mosque, and so you can enroll in that school. In fact, tonight before you go home, you should enroll, and then you will study the Arabic language because the Quran has come to us in Arabic, you see. What he is saying to this old man is, you really need to begin to move from your culture into the culture in which Arabic is supreme, because God speaks in Arabic, you see. That's really what he was saying. A movement needs to take place from your culture into the Arabized culture of Islam. Now, let's fast forward. Let's, let's move to a completely different part of the world, Tanzania, among the Zanaki, where I grew up. My father and mother went into that tribe, a people that had never heard the gospel before, and 
I mentioned that very old woman that uh, was uh, at the church two years ago when my wife and I took our oldest grandchildren to see the place where I grew up. My father, when that old woman, back there many years ago, said that she wants, at that time she was a young girl, and she said she wants to become a Christian, my father did not say, oh, that means you must study Greek because the New Testament came to us in the Greek language. The writers of the New Testament were Greek speaking. And so the New Testament is in Greek. So if you become a Christian, you must learn Greek. But don't worry, we will start a school here that will teach you to speak, to read in Greek. No, that's not what my father did at all. What did he do? He translated the Gospel of Matthew into the Greek language. So the first language that this woman ever read in, she, was, she could not read at that time, but they started a little school so that she and others like her could learn to read the Bible in their own language, Zanaki language, you see, which is to say, my father was saying, now that you're a Christian, it does not mean that you need to shift from your culture into a Western culture, into an American culture, into any particular culture. No, you can remain in your culture and we will translate the gospel into the language of your culture so that you can read the New Testament in your own mother tongue. And that is a genius of the Christian missionary movement around the world that wherever the movement goes, it always, the churches always, in their missionary frontier involvement, they always work at translating the Bible into the local language so that people can worship God in their own language. And so when we visited Tanzania with my three grandchildren two years ago, this old woman in her 90s, I mentioned this the other day, came into the church while we were worshiping about 700 people, and she held up this Gospel of Matthew. She said, this is what it's all about. She didn't hold up a Greek New Testament, no. She held up a Zanaki New Testament, you see. A Zanaki Gospel of Matthew. Because she could read it in her own mother tongue. She could remain a Zanaki. And in the church service that Sunday, she did not worship the way we worship in the United States, where my parents came from. Where my parents came from, a Mennonite church in America, they would sing in four-part harmony every Sunday when they would come together to worship. But that Sunday in Tanzania, when that woman came to meet the great-grandchildren of the missionaries who brought the gospel to her, what did she do? She not only held up the gospel of Matthew, but she began to dance. She was very crippled by arthritis, but she started to dance, you know, this crippled old woman in her Zanaki way. Why? Because she was so happy that Jesus had met her and had redeemed her, but she gave praise to God in her own language. She did not need to shift into another culture. And that's what we were trying to say yesterday uh, in our last segment about the nature of the gospel. And we talked at some length using the Messiah of Kenya as an example of the gospel taking root in a, in a culture, uh, but not calling you to move into another culture when one decides to become a Christian. Um, those Messiah people always remained Messiah, always expressed their Christian faith within the Messiah language and culture. Um, they did not feel a need to move to another culture like the Luo culture or the American culture. No, they remained in their culture, but the gospel was beginning to transform them. And one of the really significant areas that the gospel was changing them was in the area of warfare. Because this, you remember, we said this was a warrior, a warrior tribe. And they would go and they would get cows from other tribes. That was their tradition. It had been their practice for many years because they believed that all the cows in the world were given to them by God. We talked about that in our last segment. Well, when they met Christ, they said, oh no, 
the cows belong to God. <laughs> and and, uh, and uh, they are for all tribes to enjoy, not just the Maasai people, you see. And, so, and, and to fight and to kill one another over cows is not right at all. Jesus teaches us to love one another. And so literally, literally, they put aside their warrior culture and adopted a peacemaking culture in the relationship to the tribes around them. So yes, the culture was being transformed, but they remained within their culture. And so we say that they were experiencing conversion, but they were not becoming proselytes. To be a proselyte means you move from one culture to another. Conversion means you stay within your culture, uh, but the life-changing power of Christ begins to bring about a transition within your culture and in your own life. That's what we were trying to explain in our last segment yesterday. It's an area for discussion and reflection. Whenever the gospel goes from one culture to another, what should change in the culture and what may remain uh, and what should remain within the culture. But it means that the Christian movement is a movement of huge diversity. My Muslim friends frequently say to me, the churches around the world are so, so diverse. Within Islam, we all pray in exactly the same way, which is true. Always facing Mecca five times a day, a number of times they need to bow. It's all prescribed. It's all described, you see. So when someone becomes a Muslim, they move into that culture. But within the Christian movement, the gospel takes root within every culture, within every tribe, wherever the gospel goes. And so the church becomes a community of great variation and diversity around the world. It is a very interesting community with enormous diversity, like that old woman singing and dancing in the church that Sunday with my great-grandchildren, with the great-grandchildren of, um, of, uh, of those that brought the gospel to them. We strive to serve the contemporary Christian community with a variety of Christian educational and evangelistic resources. To see TVS Seminary's database, please visit tvsseminary.com. Now I want to press on. Um, we could spend much more time on that. In the Bible, it would be Acts chapter 15, which is especially significant in what I'm saying, because in that, the book of Acts is the account of the early church growing from culture to culture and their decision that when you become a Christian, you do not need to leave your culture to become part of the Jewish culture. You can remain in your culture. That was the decision that was made in Acts 15. And the issue was, in that case, male circumcision. Because in the Jewish tradition and in the Old Testament, the first part of the Bible, the first half of the Bible, it was very clearly taught that men should be circumcised. But the Gentiles did not want to be circumcised. That was not part of their, of their, of their, of their culture. And so as the church is moving now from Gentile culture to Gentile culture, one tribe after another, they didn't want to become circumcised. And so they had this meeting in Jerusalem uh, described in Acts 15, what to do about that. And the church as a whole decided that when, people become, when Gentiles become Christians, they do not need to be circumcised. They can remain within their culture. And they can eat the food they want to eat. Within the Jewish practice, there were certain foods they were not allowed to eat, like pork. Well, this morning I had some pork for my breakfast, you know. I'm free to eat pork, even though in the Old Testament it was prohibited. How do I know I'm free? Well, Acts 15 said that we're free. The decision of the church in Acts 15, we're free. People are free to eat their diet, to eat the food that they like. That one culture cannot say to another culture, you can't eat that. We're free. Um, and so uh, that decision was a decision for cultural diversity in the worldwide church as it moves from culture to culture. My Muslim friends sometimes say, why do you translate the Bible into so many languages? Well, it's for this reason, that we believe that God wants the truth of the gospel to become part of every culture. And how can that happen if people do not have the Bible in their own language? They need the Bible in their own language. And so wherever the missionaries go around the world, a very high priority is translating the Bible into the language of people. And in Africa, the first book that they mostly translated 
was the Gospel of Matthew, just like my father translated Matthew into the Zanaki language, that in almost every tribe in Africa, the first book printed, published in those tribes, in almost every tribe in Africa, is the Gospel of Matthew, in their own, in their own language, in their own native tongue, so they can worship in their own language, don't need to learn another language to become a Christian. Cultural diversity. At present, there's about 3,000 languages that have at least portions of the Bible in them. Um, there's still about 3,000 more to go, but these are all very small tribes. But the churches around the world keep working, even in the smallest of tribes, to translate portions of the Bible into the language of people with the conviction that God's plan is that everyone be able to worship God and honor God in their own language, that they don't need to learn another language when they become a Christian. It's a tremendous statement for cultural diversity.